at the end of each podcast episode, I'm going to recommend a podcast that somehow or another ties into this episode. So please listen to the whole episode of the podcast because I guarantee you, the podcast I recommend you're going to love. I've been a fan of rock and roll since, well, geez, <laughs> probably, probably when I was in my mother's womb. I just always loved oldies rock and roll. I remember listening to you know Elvis Presley on the radio and impersonating him as a young kid and hearing the temptations. But one thing that I always liked and I always mimicked were the DJs, which I guess is why I got into DJing. Well, years ago, I started listening to a show on Saturday nights on WHFC called the Saturday Night Block Party. And the knowledge that the host had was just amazing. I learned so much. And I always studied music. Whenever I DJ, I always try to learn as much about songs and the artists as I could. Me and Doug Knowles, Doug especially, was just a walking encyclopedia, or still is a walking encyclopedia. But on this episode of Conversations with Rich Bennett, I finally got a chance to speak with what I know her as the queen of oldies rock and roll radio, Joyce Conroy. She hosts the Saturday Night Block Party every Saturday night on WHFC and actually now on, I believe, one or two other stations. But she's going to go into that and talk about some of these interviews and Tell you about some of the yum yums. You're going to love it. Enjoy the conversation. Coming to you from the Freedom Federal Credit Union Studios, Harford County Living presents Conversations with Rich Bennett. Come on, you're faster than me. Guys, yeah. 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 Oh, man, you already said it. I was going to ask her. She remembered the date. I am sitting here today with, and I think I may have given her this title. I used to say the Queen of Harford County Radio, but you're no longer the Queen of Harford County Radio. To me, you are the Queen of True Rock and Roll Radio. And when I say True Rock and Roll, I'm talking about you know the good stuff from the '50s and the '60s when rock and roll came about. And I'm sitting here with the queen of rock and roll radio, Joyce Conroy. So Joyce, first of all, thank you for coming on. I know we've been talking about this for a while and, oh God, there's so much that people, I know a lot of people just, when they listen to your show, they're floored because of the knowledge you have and the stories you have. And that's one of the things I wanted to talk about. Um, but before we get into the radio part, tell everybody who Joyce Conroy is. Well, Rich, I'll gladly accept that title, Queen of Oldies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I just love rock and roll. Uh, I was fortunate, you know, I was born in 1955. And this is kind of when rock and roll was starting to take shape. And mm-hmm. uh, I was lucky because I had my mom loved Elvis Presley. And I had what an mom Angie. didn't. I know, I know. <laughs> she she was so nice. She even loaned me her records. And here I am, this little kid, you know, I'm playing on right. the record player. And uh, she even had Bill Haley's, uh, it, it was a nice uh, record on the Essex label. Whoa. And I was just floored by his voice and the Everly Brothers. Uh, my Aunt Jean is another one who would, um, when I would go down her house, she would start bringing out her 45s and I would listen along with her. And I became a big fan of the Everly Brothers at a young right. age. Wow. So, yeah. And I've been so blessed. And uh, um, I uh, just started collecting rock and roll records, fell in love with Paul Revere and the Raiders. Mm-hmm. I was all of nine years old, just started watching where the action is and uh, just oh, love the I'm way rock and roll that. makes people feel. So just over the years, I started collecting records. And uh, you know, when it comes to the knowledge, I was very shy. And really? 
Yeah, very, very shy. And the transistor radio was really a great friend to me. So when you started listening to all that music, I wanted to know more all about the performers that I was Mm -hmm. listening to, whether it was Leslie Gore or the Monkees. And how the block party really got started, and I really believe this was a calling uh, from above, Mm -hmm. Um, I would say it was about 1966, living in the Blair Edison community of Baltimore. And there were teenagers, they were up the road, they had, they brought their record player out. That was not uncommon to do in Baltimore, brought the record player out. It was summertime. They had this little pool and all the guys and the girls, they're jumping into it. And I'm hearing the sounds of the yard birds, shapes of things. Oh, wow. So many more. And um, right there as, as a as a kid, I was about 10 years old. I was looking through the gate and I said, you know, there would this would be really awesome if I could bring all those performers and peoples and people in a place where they can listen. That would really be something, but I had no idea how to do that. And you know, through my life, the radio opportunities became available and right. WHFC became available. And God is awesome because I was able to create that through him. Wait a minute. <laughs> Excuse me. So wait, was AHFC your first station? It actually was. I was a student at Hartford Community College. It was back in 1983. John Dablin was the radio director. So I started wow. out as a student and I did a show kind of similar to the block party. It was called Up on the Roof. So. Hmm. Sounds like a song. No. <laughs> it, and it was actually inspired by the song. I, I, kind of, I still believe in old school radio, the radio uh-huh. of the imagination. And I would tell the uh, listeners, Hey, we're up on a roof together and we are just sitting there listening to rock and roll away from all of the uh, chaos and the hubbub. And John was so nice. I did that show for about two years. And then I went to the broadcasting Institute of Maryland to study further. A bimmer, yes. I'm a bimmer, Me yes, too. I am. Yeah, well, that's great. <laughs> so, you know, after the Broadcasting Institute, I decided to uh, strike out you know, for commercial radio, and Captain Jim McMahon gave me my yes. first break at WAMD. Okay. All right. Something you said when we first started, when you were younger, you were shy. Yeah. And I was the same way. So when you first got into radio, when you turned that mic on and saw the on air light, how were you? Were you nervous at first? Terrible. I, it was, it okay. was the worst. I'm not the only one. <laughs> you're, you're safe. It was the worst feeling. It was, it was horror. Of, uh, and John Davlin was wonderful because I asked him, I said, John, I am really scared. And I also would love to have your knowledge. Uh-huh. So John Davlin actually sat in with me on my first show. And I was still scared, even when I came back to HFC in 2002, that Gary Helton sat in on my first show. <laughs> so, yes, I'm ter- terrified. So, for those of those people listening that want to get into radio or even DJing, weddings, stuff like that, or TV, what made you overcome that fear? You just have to get in there and do it, Rich. Yeah, you, you yeah. have to make all the mistakes. You just have to trust God. You have to you actually have to just, you know, confront the fear, get there in front of the mic. You just keep refining, keep listening back to yourself. And I think one of the things that actually stops the fear from happening, um, especially with this type of show, the block party, is I get so into the music that I forget yes. about the fear. Yeah. Yeah, it, it that does make a big difference. Um you, you talked about all the records growing up. Do you still have your records? Oh my heavens. If I could, if I could pan the, uh, the camera, you would see it's a whole bunch right over there on the side. And I keep saying I'm going to stop, but, uh, no, don't stop. <laughs> to, I'm sorry. To me, there is no better sound than vinyl. It yes. prov- I mean, granted, you have to have a very good system and a good turntable. But you're not going to get that sound out of CD or MP3 or even tape. It's just something about the sound on vinyl. It's just, I don't know. It, it, it's, I think you could pick out every little detail of a song that's recorded on vinyl and record it properly. Not with everything recorded at the same level like, like they do with a lot of songs nowadays. 
Uh, but yeah, don't get rid of them. I still have all mine. I I'm have, proud of you. Oh, I, well, except for the ones that got ruined in the flood. But <laughs> oh. I, yeah, I know. Well, here's what's messed up. So I had all my albums were on the floor and they got soaking wet. So the album jackets were ruined. I started throwing away just everything with the record and everything in there. And my brother in law was like, What are you doing? I said, The jackets are ruined, man. I said, Look at this. He said, Take the records out, throw the jackets away, but keep the records. He said, if the records aren't ruined, don't get rid of them. And I thank God I did that because you know, you don't think about that. If something gets ruined. You just take the whole thing and throw it away. But I'm glad I, I saved them because it's, uh, and my daughter's into it now too. She's got the little record player upstairs and she'll, Great. she comes down and steals some of my albums at times and, Bless her heart. Bless her. Oh yeah. I love it. You know, you can't beat it. So, all right. So you started doing or after AMD, then what you, then you came back to HFC. Well, I was very lucky. You know, people help you along the way. And one of them was Lou mm-hmm. Krieger. Lou was yes. the program director wow. at WQSR and I uh, knew my husband, Tom. And he said, you know, I was listening to you. You have potential, you need work but you have potential and I'm looking for someone to do overnights on the weekend. And this is about 87 and we okay. had actually just taken over not long ago. So I'm thinking oh, overnights, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stay up. So I decided to go for it. <laughs> and I, uh, I, you know, that was uh, my chance to get into Baltimore and to uh, really to work with someone like Lou, who has been in the business for a long time and still yeah. actually dabbles in the business a lot. And I learned a lot from him and Steve Cochran, the rock and roll doctor. He was at WQSR at the time. Steve Malf- Steve is the one that actually got me into radio. He, he Isn't he awesome? He was, <laughs> yes. Uh, God rest his soul. But yes, I know. He, he was the best and he's the one that taught taught me how to overcome my fear about Mm -hmm. talking into the microphone because he told me he said rich he said you do clubs because i was doing clubs first he said why are you so scared i said steve i said the clubs it's a couple hundred people if if that i said i'm at wqsr i got millions of people well i thought millions listening he said just look at that microphone as one individual person that's all you have to do. And I started doing that. And oh my God, what a difference. It's the great advice. Away. Great oh, advice. I, oh God, I love, I loved Steve. And then Tim. when, when I, I was there in 89, I think it was. Um, Cause I was, I interned there first, but I was doing the all request show of John Bertulis. John's a dear, Sundays. dear guy. Yeah. Loved it. Loved doing it. And, but uh, God, so how long were you at QSR? And for those of you listening in the Baltimore area, the the younger people, WQSR back then was the oldie station, and they played music. So lots of music <laughs> and personalities. Both yes. Steve Lou and Gary Michaels, they believed in that. They were and and all three of them, I've learned so much from 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 uh from Steve as you did, and he even gave me the same advice too. <laughs> he was he was really something. Oh, and, he was. Yeah, he was. So I was there for about two years. The, another company had bought them out, and decided to make changes, and they uh, wanted the uh, full time staff to uh, actually handle the weekend. So I was out. Uh, right. And I decided to go back to Hartford County. There's a Hartford County. Uh, if there's something endearing about Hartford County, as you know. Yes. And WHRF, Rick Hoschel, was nice. I said, Rich, you know, Rich, I really want to develop another oldie show that is personal, where I can really talk to the people, get feedback from them. And uh, Rich says, you know, I like the idea. So he brought me on board at WHRF, which sadly is is no longer in existence. Well, was it that? Wait a minute, I'm, wasn't HRF the college station back then? No, actually, WHRF was licensed to Bel Air. Uh, Captain Jim oh. owned them earlier, WVOB, and then he went and purchased WAMD. And then HRF went through a lot of different owners. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yep, they were the Bel Air station at one time. I'll be darned. Okay. 1520. Would... Okay, maybe, yeah, because... When I left, when I, 
I think the first station I worked at in Harford County, well, the first station I did work at in Harford County was um, ASA. Yeah. And at the time, it was ASA and HDG. And HDG, I think when I started there, it was only HDG for maybe a week or two. And that's when Prettyman bought it and made it WXCY and yeah. moved it. Yeah. But, yeah Ms. God, I forgot all about HRF. Yeah. When Mrs. Wetter, uh, she owned when it was WASA and WHDG, mm-hmm. I think they were AMFM combo at the time. Right. So you were there. That's that's great. I was there with Doug Knowles. Oh, Dougie. Yeah. <laughs> the and Doug then when, WXCY. <laughs> okay. I was going to say, because when WXCY, or when HDG became XCY, Doug went down the road with them. And he called, I was at ASA for six months. And he called me up. He said, hey, we have an opening here. I said, really? But it wasn't for on air. It was for sales. And that's when I went to XCY and started doing sales. So that was my actually my first experience really doing sales. And I blamed Doug because <laughs> and Bob Bloom because I loved doing sales. And every time I walked into a car dealership, it's just something that I loved. And I ended up getting out of radio and into car sales. So that's Bob and Doug's fault. <laughs> uh, we're we're going to blame him. Now I know who, yes. I know who to point the finger at. <laughs> All right. So after XCY... Because you, you what, HRF and NXCY? Yeah, Tom and I, my husband Tom and I did a Southern Gospel show in WXCY. And we really? Did, yeah, we did that together and kind of simultaneous with, um, uh, I also, uh, I think it was, bef- actually, was it, I was with Tom at WCAO, kind of simultaneous with WHRF in Baltimore. Uh, Tom and I did a Gospel show on the Big 60. Wow. I so, did not realize that. Yeah, see, back in those days, Rich, you could kind of like, you know, like work for different stations. Now yeah. it's a little bit harder, but, uh, you know, after after WCAO changed format, we, Tom and I, went up to WXCY and did the gospel show up there. Huh. And then. I remember, I remember hearing that. I loved it. I forgot all about that. And I didn't you. realize it was you. Yep. Me, and Tom did most of it. I kind of came in, you know, on occasion, but a lot of times, as, as you know, with radio uh, management will make changes, stations are bought. So it mm-hmm. ends up affecting what happens to you as a, as a disc jockey and, and in oh, many yeah. other aspects. So that's kind of why there's so many stations. <laughs> so, all right. So now, now you went from rock and roll and now you're doing gospel which and for you that makes sense because if your belief in God it just it goes together, um, and then after X E Y, then where did you go to? Well, I I uh, our son Greg was born. Uh, he is uh, now twenty eight and about to be married, and uh, I kind of stepped back from radio a little bit. And uh, this is really strange, you know, as uh, I became interested in the martial arts. I would take, really, yeah. When Greg was was very young, see, I, I I decided to step back from radio, and I started becoming interested in the martial arts, the way you know the character is built. You know, martial arts. Um, yeah, you have martial art masters. A lot of them mm-hmm. encourage all the fighting, but um, I have to say, Master Kim Heaney and Master Jim of Chesapeake Martial Arts were wonderful. That I decided to enroll when I got my black belt in two thousand two. <laughs> I am glad that we're recording this virtually and not in person, because if I would say something to make you mad, you'd floor me. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm totally harmless. We, we take an oath about that. So you, know, you have your black belt? I have my black belt. And, and there's benefits to that because it gets you thinking about your life yes. you know, and the things, how you pull back, how you're afraid. So. Um, when Gary Helton decided, to, when Gary was hired at WHFC, I started listening and I remembered all the fun that I had back mm-hmm. you know, when I was a student. I was able to do, uh, I was able to be creative, able to present the rock and roll, not just the top 10 songs, but if you take an artist, they have a whole repertoire of things that people just haven't heard. Yeah. And um, I I put forth a proposal to Gary Helton and Gary was wonderful. He liked it and brought me aboard to WHFC. And that's Good. where I've been for the past 20 years. No way. I've been there. I started in 2002 and this August will be my, my 20th year at the, with the college. Wow. 
I didn't realize that. But but now you're on more than just HFC now, right? I um there's a station here in Rocky Mount, Virginia, a nice guy named Don Mattingly. It's a low power FM station. Right. He brought the block party aboard and it's Q101.3 WQMR. Okay. So for those people that are listening that don't know about the block party, uh, because I know you're you get a lot of response on Facebook as well. Explain to everybody what the block party because it's not just playing music. No. Explain to everybody what the block party is. What shout is- out to shout out to who is it? Sean Costello is one of the names you've mentioned. She's all this sweetheart. Time. She discovered Sean is very nice. She discovered it by accident and got in touch with me. And that's what makes me very happy is when something in the music really mm-hmm. brings a person forth. And uh, well, the block party, what you have to do is kind of imagine you're on a block. It could be a city block, it could be, you know, in, in an alley, kind of the way I was in Belair at Medicine. And you've got this crazy woman, which is me, bringing all of my <laughs> records to different blocks. The first block is the 50s. We believe in honoring those artists like the late Bobby Rydell that you listen to, the vocal groups like Larry Chance and the Earls. So we devote that first half hour. You're on the first block with me, and it's the 50s. And uh, a lot of the yum yums in a block party language. Yum yum is a good looking you, guy who really you knows. Say that. A yum yum is a good looking guy who really knows how to sing. So you bet I am bringing out Bobby V, Bobby Vinton, all, all the Bobbies, and uh, Tony Orlando. Even you know was a was a yum yum back in the day before dawn. So yeah, that first block. Then I kind of moved to the next block, which is about. Um, my show is on at nine o'clock in the evening. Well, nine 30, mm-hmm. I start moving toward the sixties block. I'm, I'm running with all the groups. So now you've got Paul Revere and the Raiders. You've got the monkeys, Gary Puckett and the union gap, the rascals. Mm-hmm. And uh, what I do is a, a second hour. I kind of mix it up with a little bit of the seventies, like three dog night. And you have performers, singer songwriters like Lobo. And I also have a feature called the soul stop love soul and r&b so that is devoted strictly to those great artists like otis redding mm-hmm. aretha franklin and uh all the temptations all the motown the stacks and then i kind of finish out with the 70s and then hour three is classic rock you're gonna hear uh you're gonna hear deep purple come the yard birds <laughs> yeah yeah I, and i sometimes and i'm and, and the beauty of public radio is that i it, it doesn't have to be really st- strict right you you might hear eva cassidy who's a beautiful singer on the third hour or uh of course the go-go's and uh lots of times it'll be something new uh if, if an artist has like alice cooper has detroit stories i will bring that out also so it's not just the past i try to honor some of the things in the in the present on the block party so if alice cooper have you heard uh hollywood vampires yet no, I have not heard that. Not that's something. Oh. No, thank you for telling me. It's a. It's more or less. It's a super group. It's Alice Cooper, Joe Perry. Now you're sitting down, right? Yeah. Johnny Depp. Wow, Johnny Depp. Yeah, and I, I God, I forget who else, but they do a lot of classics. And Johnny Depp actually does a lot of the lead vocals on a lot of the stuff, as well as Alice Cooper, of course. But oh yeah, you get a chance. You you have to check them out. They're pretty. Pretty good. Thanks Pretty for the good. tip. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's well, and that's what I love because I learn when I listen, when I'm able to listen to your show, if I'm not working, I learn so much because your knowledge of all these groups that you bring out, even, I mean, it makes for great trivia. It and does. it's, it, it just, it blows me away. And it, it actually, made me want to start watching documentaries more at the music documentaries, which I believe there need to be a lot more. And there's one, if you haven't watched it, you have to watch it on Harry Nielsen. And I didn't realize all the stuff that Harry Nielsen did. And some of the things he didn't do, like he never performed in concert, which I never knew that and want to watch it, but all the songs he either wrote or, Record it like one that Three Dog Night covered. Um, he did, I think he did some stuff with the monkeys. 
He did. If I'm, yeah, yeah. They're the good times. There, there's a uh, Mickey Dolan's yeah. and Harry sing together. <laughs> yeah, on the I mean, title I was track. Just, <laughs> I, I just watched that one recently, and, and I was just floored because I, I always loved Nielsen, but I didn't realize all this. And then when he did the standards, which I didn't know about, I was like, "What?" <laughs> But yeah, just amazing. So, which leads me to some of the stories that you have, because you've met a lot of these artists throughout time, haven't you? I've been very blessed. Yes. How in the world? Don't tell me they were coming down to Bel Air Edison once you pulled out the record players. <laughs> <laughs> a young Joyce Conroy on the Buddy Dean show. So <laughs> well, I worked with Buddy. <laughs> did you really? Yes, I did. You know, see, you oh, meet them God. through contacts. I, Bob right. Mathers, when um, I did two tours of duty at WAMD, and okay. uh, Bob Mathers uh, and Buddy Dean, uh, Bob actually worked for Buddy for quite a while because Buddy had a station down in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And he really oh. wanted to bring Buddy back, you know, to the uh, Baltimore area via radio. And Buddy would call in his show. So on Saturdays, Bob put me in charge as producer. And that really? was an awesome job. That is, and I got to talk to Hank Ballard on the telephone. It was, and Buddy, wow. Buddy was wonderful. For those of you listening that don't know who Buddy Dean was, Buddy Dean, the Buddy Dean show was. I guess you could say the the local Dick Clark show, the local American bandstand. Yes. And I only knew of Buddy Dean from, I mean, I remember hearing about it, but then I didn't realize until later on in life that my godmother, my cousin, was a regular on there dancing all the time. That is neat. <laughs> and yeah, I started, you know, you can still find the videos of Buddy Dean on youtube thank god because and, and i said anybody that wants to get into anybody period if you love music go back and watch some of these old videos not just a buddy dean but dick clark of those shows but also of the performances and because one of my favorite performances and i don't know if he timed it correctly or if he had that much emotion in the song was johnny ray when he did cry yes because the first time i seen him before and he just literally had tears coming out of his eyes i was like wow and right then and there became one of my favorite singers of all time uh but there's to me there's the artists back then there's nothing there i don't believe there's anyone like them today they can't be duplicated oh no, they can't no no you're so right there it, it's the i i think they had more of a bond with their fans than the groups of today because i i when I, I blame social media for that in a way because i think a lot of people today let it go to their heads whereas a lot of people back then were just so i don't know how they just loved their fans they love them and they didn't mind talking to them um so paul revere and the raiders how many times have you seen them? Oh my heavens, you know, I actually, the sad part, I only saw them once because you have to understand, I didn't have a lot of money well, as a young kid. I was right. begging off of my father who, uh, <laughs> uh, first concert was 1966 and the tickets were $7 and 50 cents. And back then wow. that was pretty, uh, that was a hefty price, but I begged him enough and he, he knew I loved them. So I, I saw them at the Baltimore civic center, but this was a real honor. And again, this is where God comes in. I had a chance to MC Paul Revere and the Raiders. Now this is a, a, the later version right. of the Raiders, but Paul was still very active. Um, the Baltimore County professional firefighters would bring in a lot of those acts mm -hmm. and um, Johnny Dark of WCAO was oh, going God. to do it for the, um, for the firefighters. And he said, Joyce, I just can't, um, I, I, I don't have my schedule. It doesn't work out. I think you should be the one to do it. So Mike Crosby, who was um, kind of spearheading it for the firefighter, says, yeah, why don't you? And I'm like, oh, that horror <laughs> comes back, even though it's a dream come true. The horror is there, you know, and I decided to go for it. And it was one of the most amazing experiences. Paul could not have been nicer. He right. was he was a doll baby. And he really he and the Raiders. 
Uh, Paul was very old school. He believed after a show, getting out there in a meet and greet line and talking to the fans and expected his mm-hmm. performers to do the same. Yeah. Just, just a, t- just That's a great. dear guy. So is that, that was the first show you emceed? That was the first show I emceed. And I did some gospel shows with the gospel groups with, with my husband, Tom. Okay. And uh, I'd like to do it again. I love emceeing. I love being with the people. It's it's a real great experience. Fear and all. All right. So you're hearing that, people? Anybody's got any shows coming up? You need an MC. Joyce Conroy, she's right there. Give Would her love a call. Do She'll do it. That would be that would be a blast. Uh, I mean, <laughs> God, even if the even if it's a new group coming up, yes, you, you know, you never know, and it's just fun just connecting with the crowd. It it sure is, Rich. You said it. So, with your time in radio, because you did a lot of interviews, right? Yes. Any idea how many? I I don't know. It's I I have to uh, I have to go ahead and count them. But I'm thank you for asking that question. <laughs> I'm getting back into it again because um Good. our Easter show, which is on April the 16th on WHFC, my special guest is going to be Ernie Sheffalo, who is the original design. He's a designer. Uh, Pacific Ioneer was his company. He was the brains behind the original stones, the Rolling Stones tongue logo. Really? Yes. And he also designed Jesus Christ Superstar, the LP, those beautiful angels. Ernie was the designer behind that. And the uh, also the cast. It's this beautiful booklet you get, if you remember, with the Jesus Christ Superstar yeah. LP. Oh, I got the album. Yes, he did. Ernie was the artist. And, and this was still very early in his career. He designed the cast picture that you see in the booklet. So he's going to be my special guest. I'm back to interviewing again. God, you know what you need to do in all honesty mm-hmm. to start a podcast because on radio, you, you, you know, you want, you always want that interview to go longer yes. where you get somebody like that. Mm-hmm. And on, unfortunately on radio, you, you can't play the whole thing, but no. Oh yeah. Just record the whole thing and do it as a pot. Start doing them as a podcast. Do you actually, do you, do you have all your old interviews on tape or anything? I do. Many of them. I just, when Keith Allison of the Raiders, when he passed away, I re-aired that interview on WHFC and it was great for people to hear the accomplishments that he made in his life, you know, and not only as a Raider, but also, you know, the session work that he mm. did. Yeah. I, 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 I think, I think you have a, an actual podcast there. The, the, the Saturday night block parties, block party interviews of Joyce Conroy or something, because that, I mean, those things, a lot of times you'll hear them on radio and then it's, it's gone. Yes. But at least at the podcast, it's always there again for other people to enjoy. You can enjoy them all the time. Cause you have them. <laughs> but That's true. You've given me an idea. You've given See me an it. idea. And WHFC now, is, is I think, starting to do that. They're now getting the um, the support, you know, to be able to do that, which is wonderful. Yeah, you do. were right. You were right. It stays. Yeah. As a matter of fact, because I host, I host uh, right, on the Chesapeake Podcast Network, I have the college podcast on there. And now they're teaching podcasting at the college as well, you know, which is great, too. So. Out of all the interviews you've done, and I know it's pro- it's probably hard for you. I'm I'm not going to put you on the spot there because I know you can't just pick one. Uh, but what are you, what are some of your favorite interviews that you've done? The guy that touches my heart all the time, Tommy James. Oh, you yes. could not get a person who is. I mean, Tommy is the ideal subject. He's a very good person, old school. Also, you know, he believes in meets and greets. Tommy is so easy to speak with, and uh, his late wife Linda at one time was managing him, and she was just as nice. And uh, I, I've spoken to him. I think it's been about three times on radio, and. Uh, very delightful. Loves the fans. He loves vinyl too. He 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 has a vinyl collection. Wow! Uh, just a very good, you know, spiritual performer. So right. I would have to. I pick him as my favorite. As your favorite? Yes. Who else would be in there? Let's say your top five. I would. Uh, let me see. Keith Allison was very nice. He was okay. just a nice Southern boy. You could talk to him. Very very personal. And uh, 
let me see, Peter Noon. I had a chance to speak with Peter Noon. He's totally crazy. <laughs> I was going to say that had to be a fun interview. <laughs> he is totally crazy. Wow. I, I love Peter. He's, he's very nice. And uh, another one was Billy Hinchy of Dino Desi and Billy. Also uh, a, a guy that you don't realize had lots of other talents up, uh, produced this great documentary about Dennis Wilson of the beach boys. So wow. it was through that interview that I learned a lot about Billy. And another really nice person was uh, James Lowe of the Electric Prunes. Oh, my God. He uh, uh, he and the Electric Prunes, they were kind of like uh, going, uh, it was back, I would say maybe about like 2009. They had put out another uh, LP. And they he did? was, yeah, they wanted, and he wanted to promote it. They were at the Rams Head in Annapolis, and uh, James was wonderful, just wonderful to talk to. Wow. He has a great radio voice as well, so I would have to pick those as as a favorite. And uh, also, uh, there were two brothers from Canada, very nice. They were uh, David and Greg Fitzpatrick, and they have a following up in Canada. And uh, Two dear guys. I have to really put them into there because in, into that list because they uh, just so easy to talk to, so accessible. Love the fans. That's a big thing for me. I, I right. can tell if they love the fans. That is uh, that communicates. So, how many of your yum yums have you interviewed? Oh my! I, I just I have, love that when you say that. I, I crack up all the time. I love it. I I I, I would have to count. <laughs> Actually, I like all of them, so they all qualify <laughs> as yum yums. <laughs> Part of the problem that I've had when I did live radio is that because I was on so late, you know, like yeah. nine, nine o'clock, it was hard to get people were interested, but could not because of performance schedules. That's a concert time, you know, when people when performers. Yeah. Do their concerts so the one beauty of, of, of doing it remotely is that i can now get more of those performers that were whereas before i couldn't oh yeah that's which is why i love the way we're doing this you know yes. virtually um god so there's so many different people you can talk to now throughout not just different parts of the country but throughout the world yes the very very and, much so yeah i did one with uh it was two of us that were here and somebody from England and it, it was, it was great. I just, you know, it's, and of course, see, seeing you is great too. I, it's hard to me. It's harder to talk to somebody when you can't see them. I know. I know. It's, I don't know why, but so who is on your list that you would love to interview that you haven't talked to yet? Well, I tell you what, one is Rick Stevers of Frigid Pink. He is the longtime drummer. And Rick and I okay. have talked. Um, he is down on the list. Um, Ernie Sheffalo is going to be part of the block party uh, in the future. We're doing a little thing called Ernie's Corner. Since he's designed over 200 album mm -hmm. covers, he's going to do a little blurb, you know, where he talks about an album cover and then we lead into a song. That's a great idea. Yeah. I'd love, I love to that. talk to Tommy James again as many times. Burton Cummings is another uh, is, is the oh, performer God. that I would love. I've met Burton and I would love to speak with him on radio. Wow. He's he, still doing stuff too, isn't he? Still performing. Yes, he is. He and Randy Backman, they're still, they're still uh, getting out there, which is wonderful. So Definitely wow. Burton. I, I would love to talk with him. And I, I talked to Gary Puckett. I meant to put Gary on my list. I'd love to talk to Gary again. Man, God, you so you still I think everybody getting into radio needs to do that. Have a wish list. Yes. Like that. Uh and if they say no, they say no. You gotta ask. That's true. That, that's that's the thing. You just gotta ask. And sometimes you might, it may take a while. Like this young lady, I uh, God, I think I kept trying to get her on. It's been maybe, I don't know, two years, three years. And here she is sitting with me today. <laughs> well, oh, thank you. I know. See, because now I'm not, a, not, not, not on late at night. <laughs> I, I, and I know it can be hard at times. It, it, it's, um, it, it's crazy, but the good thing is, like I said, now that you're doing it or you're, you know, you had the virtual setup, you could talk to them at any time. So with the Saturday night block party, tell everybody, first of all, how they can listen to it, stations and website. 
Yeah, what you can do, it's very easy. The college has a link. It is www.whfc911.org. Once again, whfc911.org. There is a link right there also. You know, a lot of the uh, the, the third-party vendors like TuneIn, you can also, mm-hmm. WHFC. Dave May was wonderful, our host of Desert Island Jazz. He made that happen. If you go to like TuneIn or I think yes. it's Radio Locator, a lot of those uh, third-party vendors, you'll find WHFC, you'll find the link and it takes you right there to the station to our stream. The other thing is too, for those people that have uh, like Alexa and all that, believe it or not, all you have to do is say Alexa, play WHFC and she'll start playing it right away. That's great. I know that because that's how I do it most of the time. (laughs) (laughs) Either that or online. Yeah. I'm still yeah, kind of learning the technology. You know, I, like I said, I'm old school, but, but, you know, some of us old schoolers, <laughs> it takes us a while, but we, we get oh, there. Oh, it, it's amazing. I mean, I mean, you think about it when you and I are, right, cause you started in radio, what'd you say? 80, 83. Yeah. But 83. Okay. And I started in 89. So basically a lot of things were the same. I think with the addition, they all, they had CDs now. But you and I, we were doing vinyl. Mm -hmm. We had the carts and sometimes even reel to reel. Oh my God. Yes. (laughs) Now, oh God, you remember splicing them things, having to do a show? I was just telling Ernie Sheffalo about that. (laughs) Oh God. But and now everything's digital and it just, I don't don't know. To, To me, in a way, it takes away the old feel of it. Yeah, I just I something about putting that vinyl on. I don't. That's just me. Um, but yeah, everything has changed throughout the days. The boards are smaller. Yeah, that you that you use to run. Um, now you can actually do your show from home, which you do, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, back in the day, you really couldn't do that. No, you you had to be there, and it's uh, it's so great now because uh, you have the uh, you can uh, every MP3 files it, the show becomes mm-hmm. an MP3 file, and you upload it, and it it goes right through the automation system. We uh, WHFC has a really nice one, and a lot of the stations now are doing that. They're doing it uh, having more remote jobs. COVID COVID really played a very big part yes. in that. Yeah, COVID changed a lot. It did change Stupid a lot of COVID. things. <laughs> but, but then again, it also changed some things for the better. Yes. Which I believe, uh, otherwise we wouldn't be able to to do this. Uh, well, we would have if I would have figured it out, but a lot of people didn't know about yeah, recording virtually. How many people were doing Zoom meetings? Not a lot. No. Yeah, you know, before COVID hit. So Joyce Conroy, where is Joyce Conroy going to be in five years? I still want to do it. I still want to be, you know, on the God, ball I love party. you. Thank God you said I, that. I really do. I, I've, I've said that because, um, uh, love rock and roll. I think it has a legacy there. I'm rich, still uncovering things I never knew mm-hmm. about certain performers and, and things that they've done. And I want to be able to bring that out to the family on WHFC to let them know and, and realize, you know, Hey, there was more than just top 10 songs. A lot of performers had, uh, that, that, you know, they were experimenting with different things. Right. And, and that's what I, I, I want to do. I just want to, if, um, God, thank you, you know, for the years I've had and, and and thank you, Hartford Community College. But yeah, just to keep doing it, I want to be able to get out there a lot more I, as with people. Love emceeing, right. that is a goal that I have to uh, talk to more people, talk to more performers and just keep bringing the music forward. So you're willing to travel back to Hartford County to MC events? If yes, yes. Okay. I, I am I am retired from uh my full time job. I was in the legal profession for a long time. Uh and you know, and was able to retire. And this is uh this is great. It's a labor of love, it's a lot of fun. It is really Does Tom fun. have his pilot license by chance? Not not yet. My uh, my son, you know, actually flew a little bit. So I might be counting oh. on him. <laughs> <laughs> 
go to Joyce's house. She's got an airplane parked in the backyard. That's her. Oh, that would be nice. <laughs> that would be really nice. <laughs> One of the things, and I said this earlier, and I went to ask you this, I completely forgot, but your knowledge when it comes to the artists and everything, is just, it's off the wall. I, I can't believe everything you know. Were you the one that used to buy, you know, Billboard would always put the book out every year, which had a lot of, you know, facts and everything in there. Were, were you the one that always bought that, the Billboard book every year and, and more or less studied it like Doug and I? <laughs> <laughs> Billboard, I actually, uh, I you know, now with the internet, you know, do a lot of, a uh, mm. lot of, that. that's the great thing. You know, you can really get on various sites and just now with, now that there's a good thing about the social media. Uh, it certainly has had its, its uh, problems, but the one good thing about the social media now is that you can actually go right to the artist or someone yes. in their management and ask them that question. Was this really true? You know, was it not true? And uh, that's, that has been a great source of information is social media when you have artists that are very accessible. And I think when they allow themselves to be accessible, it, it it's great because we can, especially in broadcasting, we can talk about it and share those facts. But just over the years, I did a lot of reading. Of course, I had I started out with Sixteen Magazine and Tiger Beat, you know. But I, oh God, yes. I, I kind of read them with a grain of salt as I got older because you know you really want solid facts. But read a lot of like biographies, Meatloaf's by autobiography, so just different things over the years. Okay, plus the album jackets. Yes, the the yeah, those album jackets are fabulous. Yeah, it's a shame that uh, can't read an MP3 jacket, unfortunately. No, that's. <laughs> I think that's where vinyl really played a big part. You can really. Find I think that might be one of the reasons vinyl's making a comeback as well, because the artists can get so much more out there about themselves. Not maybe not as many songs, but information about themselves. And I still think it's coming back because of the sound quality. Yes. Uh, and you're starting to see more record shops pop up again. That's a good There's, thing. Yeah. There was just another new one that just opened up in Bel Air. So now you, now you have a, I don't know if the one's in the mall still, but I know of two. There's one on Main Street, I believe. And another one in, I think it's the Bel Air Shopping Center. So you're starting to see, yeah, you know, the record shops pop back up. You're starting to see a lot of places carry the old vinyl, you know, for people to buy, which is good. Um, the only thing I really haven't seen are eight track tapes. Oh wow. <laughs> which we may not see them again. I know some people still have cassettes. I had a young lady on who um I, I cracked up because she's She's a performer, but she also does acupuncture. I call her the singing acupuncturist. She still has cassettes and still listens to them. I was like, and she buys, she could still buy them. I'm like, cassettes? She said, yeah. She goes, I just pop them in my, you know, it's like, wow. <laughs> bless her. Okay. Bless her. <laughs> I just, I just remember having to put the pen or the pencil in there and winding that thing. Oh, the my. Uh <laughs> I know that was awful. Um, well, don't feel bad. I used to have the cassettes and I used to have the cassette player and I would have uh, have it right on my car seat, the passenger seat, and I would be listening to a cassette through the- Oh, uh, no, so it wasn't part of your stereo, your car stereo. And no, it you wasn't. Had you had know. the seat. Oh wow! No, no, I, uh, I, yeah, I've had, I had the cassettes and the eight track. I, you know, I, I can remember the concert for Bangladesh, you know, with George Harrison mm -hmm. and all the great performers there. That was one of my first eight tracks. I can always remember the click, you know, when it would go, when it would change over. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think one of my my first ones was uh, I think it was Bob Dylan at Budokan. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, that was one of the first eight tracks I had. Um, but as far as vinyl goes, I, and I, I can't tell you the first one I bought. I just inherited a lot of stuff. Like my brother got, would get tired of listening to an album. He would give it to me. Um, that's how I got turned on to like Johnny Winters and um, uh, God. Oh, and James gang, James gang. He turned me on to them, which, yeah, that was the other than that. Before that, I was always listening to buddy Holly 
Elvis Presley, Motown, loved Motown. And it just, and then the switch from that to the James gang is like, whoa, this, this is new. This is different. It's okay. This is pretty cool. Yeah. It's okay. And I think all that stuff throughout the years gave me a greater appreciation of music, which is one of the things I love about HSC because you hear everything. Mm -hmm. And I love listening to Terry in the morning, playing the jazz. Uh, but I'm probably the only type that can go from, I can listen to jazz. Then I can turn around and listen to Tommy James and the Shondells. Then I can turn right around and listen to Gene Krupa. Yeah. And stuff like that. I just love all genres, all different types and opera, believe it or not. That's just me. Yes. I, and, but I love to pick apart the music. And I, that, that sounds negative, not pick apart. In other words, I love to sit back and listen to the different instruments and the vocals and just pick stuff out and wondering how they do things. And like when I, the documentary I was telling you about with Nielsen and when I'm this, all the times I listened to Nielsen, I always thought he had backup singers. And in the documentary, they were talking about how when the Beatles first heard his album and then a critic's like, I can't believe he didn't give the backup singers any credit on the album. He never, he didn't use backup singers. He was one of the first to overdub. So all the vocals were him. And I just, I never realized that. And that night I'm listening to Nielsen just to hear these little things. And it's, just gave me even more of an appreciation for it. Like the Beatles, you know, I don't know. Have you seen the, uh, I think it's on Disney plus. Have you seen get back yet? I haven't seen it yet. No, you have to watch it. That when I watched that, they it gave me a whole new appreciation of the Beatles again. Um, but you learn how they wrote their music and everything. And it's just, it was amazing. It just, it blew me away. It, it was pretty wild. I am so proud of you. That is great. And that's kind of what we're encouraging people through WHFC, through public radio, is go ahead, feel free to explore. You know, yes. Because you, as you as you mature, you start to look at those things. I'm I'm learning that too, Rich. I'm I'm there's so many things like uh the wrecking crew, you know, Leon Russell was part of that, you know, stellar group of session players. You you yes. learn so much and that's one of the reasons why I, I host the block party on WHFC and support public radio because a person such as yourself, a music lover, you want to find out more and, and we allow you to do that. We, we give you that exposure through the various genres that we play. That is great. Thank well, you for sharing that. If it wasn't for public radio, so many people wouldn't know about some, so many groups out there like Kansas, you know, uh, what was what was the other one I was thinking? Uh, Super, maybe it was Super Tramp. Because public radio, you were able to play those songs that you don't hear on commercial radio, the long ones. And some of those songs are the greatest songs you know you ever hear. Um, or I, I don't want to say the B sides, but the songs that aren't played all the time on radio, you get a new appreciation of it. And as a matter of fact, it was HFC the other day. Oh God, I forget. It was one of the students. Oh God, I'm going to forget the artist he played. Um, oh, this is going to bug me. Anyways, <laughs> so he played it and I'm like, wait a minute, that voice sounds familiar. Who, who is that? It may have been Rick Springfield, come to think of it. Um, but it wasn't one of his hits. And I was blown. Away. I was like, wow. How come this wasn't a hit? This is a very good song. And it's, I think a lot of times with public radio, you know, you're able to play those songs that from a, a known artist that nobody's ever heard. Yes. I, I guess you could say the deep cuts or whatever. And it makes a difference. It gives you a whole new appreciation for it. It sure does. It it really does. I know John Fred and his Playboy band. Um, I talked to John's wife, the, the late John Fred. Boy, he is so missed. People didn't realize that he was more than Judy in Disguise. Just some of the great yeah. Cajun soul. Wow, could he sing it? And uh, public radio allows you to do that, which is wonderful. And uh, uh, people and, and 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 people are amazed. It just did the reaction that you had. I never knew that artist did that. Yeah, 
And that, that is, that's just so awesome. So somebody getting into <laughs> radio today now, cause this is one of the things I'll never forget. And I, and I don't know if you remember this, but at the broadcasting Institute of Maryland, one of the first things, and I think it was Bill Riley that told us this <laughs> was if you're getting into radio, you better be ready to be fired because <laughs> you will get fired no matter what. Um, but if somebody, so those of you that want to get into radio, just although that might be different today, <laughs> um, somebody that wants to get into radio, what's the best advice you could give them? Well, I would say, you know, go, if you are able, you know, first of all, you know, do not give up your full-time job, keep your skills. Mm -hmm. I, now I started out part-time is the way that I did it uh, because I, um, you know, was able to keep my full-time job because radio, when you start out, you're not going to make a lot of money. You start out at the bottom right. rung for the most part. But I would say if you could find a, a, like a place like WHFC that has a learning lab, or if you are lucky, there's not many of those family owned stations anymore. Cause that's where no. you really honed your craft. But if someone is getting in the radio, I would say if you could find a learning place like WHFC, where you can do hands-on, where you can volunteer as part of the community, learn it that way because you're going to get in there and be able to make all the mistakes and be able to, you know, hone your own style. Um, yes. If you could find one of those family owned stations in a lot of the uh, smaller places, if you have the finances and you're able to, you know, go there. Yeah, by all means, uh, find that station, you know, work for them, whether it's on the weekend, you will, uh, you'll, you'll kind of learn it through trial and error. So uh, that's probably the best advice. It's a little harder now, Rich, than it was when we yeah. graduated because you don't have those outlets anymore. No, no, you're seeing more. Uh, you know, big companies own so many stations in one area, which I believe when we, you and I first started, you know, a company couldn't own uh, a certain amount of stations in right. one area. Yeah. Uh, but that, yeah, that has changed. And actually, do you, as a DJ, as an on-air personality, do you need to have an FCC license anymore? I, I do have mine, you know, from back in the eighties, but uh, I, I don't, I think, I think the rules have changed. I don't think you do. Yeah. I do, don't, don't quote me I on think the that. Station, I think the station does. Yeah. Yeah. But, the station definitely has to you yeah. know, uh, renew their license with the FCC. There's a whole bunch of regulations, but yeah, back now I have my, my, you know, I didn't, they used to, used to have to take a very extensive test. Mm -hmm. in, in the seventies, but then when deregulation came along, you just applied for it and, and it's very small, small card, but yeah, I don't think you, I don't think you were required to have it anymore. Yeah. I think mine was still, I think mine was left on the wall of WASA, <laughs> I'm if sure. I'm not mistaken. Cause I mean, it was, <laughs> when I got it, it was wallet size, maybe a little bit bigger. I can't remember. Uh, but whatever station you worked at, it had to be displayed Yeah, at the time. And yeah, when I, man, I think it was left up there. Well, it's no longer there now. Oh, guarantee my. you that after all the work that was done up there, have license but, will travel. You know, and churches yeah. are another nice way to learn. You know, especially if you want to get mm -hmm. into the audio end, you want to go ahead and do some production. Your local church, if if uh, if if they have a sound system, by all means, take advantage of that. I've talked yes, to so many to people in production and they said, I learned through my, my church and, and that, that, that's great. Just great education. Yeah. Cause a lot of people don't realize getting into radio. That's one of the, one of the things you're probably going to have to do as well as be the board operator. Mm -hmm. Yes. More than, more than likely you're not going to get lucky enough where you work at a station to where they have their own board operator for your show. No, not, and not anymore. It's, well, you're doing it now. You're, you're, well, I guess you're operating a board. Mm -hmm. Well, at least when you do your show, you are, Yeah, you know, from home. And at, which is one way a lot of people could learn as well, because nowadays you can get a board and do it from home. Mm -hmm. you know, do like what I was doing growing up, do your own fake radio station <laughs> and <laughs> act like you're on the air doing it or whatever. 
it, which I was fine doing it until somebody would come downstairs and I would just zip right up. I couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people started out that way. My brother, you know, he would take like a, a, a lamp and, and he would, my brother's also in broadcasting and he would take mm-hmm. like part of a lamp and pretend he was on the air when he was a kid. <laughs> so that's, that's actually starting. You're, you're creating a vision that, that that's, that's not too crazy. A lot of people say, well, oh, that sounds really weird. <laughs> it's not, not, I, I believe in creative visualization. It, it's it's amazing something i've noticed too with radio have you noticed that and i don't know if if they're not taught this anymore or whatever i don't hear the djs i i hear a couple of them but i don't hear uh, most of them talking up a song anymore in other words you know knowing that when the vocals are going to kick in and you're t- whether you're doing the weather or whatever and then as soon as that vocal hitch you were done. I don't hear that as much. Yeah, some do program you? directors are now not having you do that. They just want you to start. You know, they don't want you talking up a song. Um, and I've heard that a lot in commercial radio. Yeah. The other thing I I don't hear a lot on commercial radio is the DJs telling you the songs that were being that were played or yeah. that are about to be played. Yeah. It's like. I mean, come on, because that's one of the things I hate is that I'm driving and an old song comes on and my wife will be, my wife and I will look at each other and like, oh man, I love that song. And she goes, yeah, who is that? I said, God, I can't remember. Then I get yelled at. She goes, oh, come on, you're a DJ. You're supposed to know this. But I, so, all right, well, wait, let's wait because they're going to tell us. And they don't tell you. So unless you have Shazam on your phone. Yeah, or something <laughs> digital, you know, like a, a, you, yes. know you can see it. Yeah. It's, irritating i can't stand it <laughs> i have i've been out of commercial radio for so long i don't know what the reasoning is behind that but um i try i really work hard to get uh, there's maybe a few like when it comes to timing i can't give titles but i always believe that the title and the artist should, mm-hmm. should be given they should be given that credit i think the reason behind it is and you said it you, you said it but you probably don't realize you said it commercial radio mm-hmm. So the less the DJ says, the more time they have to play ads for, you know, all their advertisers. Yeah. I'm sure that plays into it. Yeah. Because you figure, I mean, everything is still on a time schedule. Yeah. And it just, uh, it's sad. Joyce, do you have anything to add whatsoever? Just to say thank you so much for having me. And I just want to thank. Oh, it's uh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank the community of Hartford County. Just thank Hartford Community College, WHFC, the listeners. Uh, you made, you know, my dream come true. I'm able to share, share about, you know, music. And I'm always grateful for that. I'm really blessed. And, and uh, I want to keep doing it. I just want to keep yeah, doing it. Yeah, I was going to say, don't stop doing it. Thank you. Don't don't stop because, I, and I think in all honesty, please tell me your shows are recorded. I mean, you keep the recordings of yes, all your I shows. Do. Yes, I do. And okay, that's the beauty good. of it. Yeah. Because yeah. I believe, you know, when Joyce Conroy is up there playing the music for God, Joyce, all her shows are still going to be down here on a station, whether it's HFC or whatever, sort of like they do with the old Wolfman Jack show Mm -hmm. to where people can still hear them and still enjoy them and still be educated because that's the other great thing about your show. And I've said it before, it's because of your knowledge, people are getting education as well. It's not just hearing the song. You're learning about the song. You're learning about the artist. And that's something that, Actually, other DJs really don't. I mean, I know Greg doesn't, and Dave may. I mean, but you hear it on public radio, but commercial radio, you don't hear that anymore. And I want to thank you for that because every time I listen to your show, I'm learning something new. Thank you. you all know, the time, which I think is important. Thank you, Rich. And I'm still learning too, you know, and, and let me thank Jesus because if it wasn't for him, I, I, you know, the shy kid would have never, I would have never gotten out of the alley, you know? So I, I, uh, my faith has really uh, been very important and I, really encourage people keep exploring the music. Don't be afraid. You might find yes. out something new and you're going to be amazed. 
And you got to let me know when you start that podcast. I think you need to. I mean, all of them interviews need to be available. I will. Terry Troyer, if you're listening, uh, just saying, <laughs> Joyce, Joyce, Joyce is ready to start a podcast of all her old interviews. Oh. Hey, look at the bright side with it. You don't have a lot of recording to do because they're already recorded. Yeah. You just need to do little intros about them. That's it. Yeah, they're, they're really neat. I love looking at the podcast. I think it's great. And I love to see, you know, like uh, the young people, you know, like they're yes. getting into it. That That's wonderful. And, and, and just to be a part of the technology. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, how much. Thank God I'm not recording this and have to worry about changing a reel behind <laughs> I, Joyce, hold on a minute. We ran out of time. I got to put a new reel on. I've had where it almost ran over when I was learning at WHFC. It, it, those things were big. And, and it's like, oh, oh yeah. my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's Joyce, a horror tell, story, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> tell everybody again how they can hear your show, the Saturday Night Block Party. Would love to have you. If, you, uh, if, if you're in Bel Air, it is 91.1 on the FM side, WHFC. And if, you're, uh, if you have a computer, just log on to whfc911.org. We'd love to have you. Joyce, the queen of oldies rock and roll. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And you know what? I'm going off the wall here, but because with the with the changing of the podcast, the rebranding, if I ever get uh, you know, some of these dream musicians I would love to get on. Would you be willing to co-host with me? Oh, I'd love to. Okay. Oh, I, I, I is it both Catholic? Be <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you didn't say the one about the bear. <laughs> Joyce, thank you so much. You're welcome, Rich. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Bye now. God. I want to thank Joyce, the queen of oldies rock and roll radio, Conroy, for coming on again. And please listen to her show. I guarantee it, you are going to love it. And you're going to learn a lot, too. WHFC911.org. That's the easiest way to listen to it. Or if you have Alexa, just say, Alexa, play WHFC Saturday nights and you'll listen to it. I have a great podcast for everybody to listen to as well. And Joyce, you'll even love this podcast. Rock and Roll High School with Pete Ganbarg. This is an interview series that spotlights some of the most important figures in the history of contemporary music. Interviews are done by Pete Ganbarg, who is the president of A&R at Atlantic Records. Some guests like, uh, just to give you an idea, Tommy James. That's one of Joyce's yum yums. Cousin Brucey, Clive Davis, Sam Morrow, Sam and Dave, Todd Rundgren, uh, Gloria Gaynor. I, there's so many great episodes, so many great interviews on this. So again, that is Rock and Roll High School with Pete Ganbarg. I hope you enjoyed the conversation, and I hope that you listened to Joyce's show, The Saturday Night Block Party. And actually, if you do listen to it, if you're on Facebook, join the group. There's actually a group out there called Saturday Night Block Party Fan Club. And go ahead and join that and keep up to date with everything. Until next time, my name is Rich Bennett. And thanks for joining the conversation. I want to share an amazing experience I had with Tar Hill Construction Group when I needed to install a new roof on my home. Let me tell you, they are truly a cut above the rest. Tar Hill Construction Group is an award-winning residential and commercial roofing and exteriors contractor focusing on roofing, siding, gutters, and solar solutions. Proudly serving Baltimore, Hartford, and Cecil counties, they make it their priority to make a positive impact in the communities they serve first while providing exceptional services in roofing and exteriors. From start to finish, Tar Hill Construction Group proved to be a reputable and dependable contracted solution. Their quality installations and good communication kept me informed and reassured throughout the entire process. It's no wonder they have been voted Harford's best roofing contractor and best home improvement contractor for three years running. But here's what really impressed me. 
Tar Heel Construction Group's commitment to continued service and registered warranties. They stand behind their work, ensuring that I have peace of mind for years to come. What's even more remarkable is their dedication to giving back to the community. They aggressively support and uplift the neighborhoods they serve, making a positive difference in people's lives. I feel incredibly grateful and humbled to have chosen Tar Heel Construction Group for my roof. They have earned my trust and respect for being the only contractor to be voted Harford's best roofing contractor and Baltimore's best roofing contractor in the same year. So if you're looking for top-notch roofing and exterior solutions, look no further than Tar Heel Construction Group. Visit their website at tarheelconstructiongroup.com or give them a call at 410-638-7021. Again, that's 410-638-7021. Experience the excellence and community impact for yourself. Tar Heel Construction Group, building excellence one roof at a time. 